it is my pleasure to in introduce Susan Stryker, who will be talking about the life and death of Francis Thompson, intersections of transgender history, race, disability, and sex work after the US Civil War. So for those of you who don't know who Susan is, I'm going to tell you just a small piece of her biography, because if I told you the whole thing, we'll be here all night listening to that. So Susan Stryker earned her PhD in United States history at the University of California, Berkeley in 1992. She later held a Ford Foundation Social Sciences Research Council postdoctoral fellowship in sexuality studies at Stanford. And she's been a distinguished visiting faculty member at Harvard, at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia, Simon Fraser University over in Vancouver, University of California at Santa Cruz. She's the author, the co-author, author, the editor, or co-editor of numerous books and anthologies, including, among others, the Transgender Studies Reader, numbers one and number two, uh, Transgender History, the Roots of Today's Revolution. She's also won an Emmy Award for her doctor, documentary, The Screaming Queens, The Riot at Compton's Cafeteria, and is also the recipient of awards, uh, several awards in LGBTQ studies. So Dr. Stryker also served for several years as the executive director of the GLBT Historical Society in San Francisco, and for five years as the director of the Institute for LGBT Studies at the University of Arizona, where she is currently an associate professor of gender and women's studies and coordinator of the university's transgender studies initiative, and she's the founding co-editor of the academic journal TSQ Transgender Studies Quarterly, and I didn't tell you all of it. <laughs> All right, so uh, short abstract, and then I will turn it over to Susan Stryker. So this lecture is drawn from Stryker's forthcoming book, What Transpires Now? Transgender History and the Future We Need. It tells the story of Francis Thompson, whose congressional testimony after the Memphis Massacre of 1866 was instrumental in the establishment of radical reconstruction, the con which is the continued occupation of the defeated South by the victorious North. A decade later, as the U.S. debated ending Reconstruction in the context of a bitter presidential election, Thompson was targeted for ulterior political purposes and the details of her personal life became fodder in the national campaign. Thompson's story and her eventual fate offer a sobering reminder that many current issues about sex work, disability, gender complexity, and race have deep historical roots. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Susan Stryker. Thank you, Aaron. Um, it's, I've known Aaron for like, how long now? A long time now. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you, yeah, it makes me feel old to like hear all of that stuff <laughs> that you read. Cause it's like, really, it's just like you do a little bit constantly and over decades it all kind of adds up and takes a long time to read, but there we go. So um, anyway, so thank you for, um, uh, for having me here tonight. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, thanks, Michael, for your your help, uh, you know, with all of the, the tech stuff. I, I just happened to be here this week doing research uh, at the Transgender Archive on Reed Erickson for this book that I'm working on. And I said, Aaron, you want to have dinner? And he said, sure. Uh, and, I said, and you want to give a talk? And it's like, Sure. So, so here we are. Um, and I had just have to say, it's like it feels really nice to be in Canada, where I have, um, you know, I've spent a year at Simon Fraser. I love the Pacific Northwest, and increasingly, you know, I sort of feel like our troubles to the south. It's like it's starting to look like something out of The Handmaid's Tale, and it's just like I'm just really, really happy to be here. And with that, I will segue into the talk tonight. Um, it's drawn, as, as, um, as Aaron said, from my book, What Transpires Now. So I've got a little introductory material, then we'll get into the substance of the talk. <clears throat> Making our identities real is what we trans people do. And we bring our worlds along with us. This is our talent, our burden, our necessity, our gift. This is what transpires now. New realities, emergent trans realities, flowing across the gap that, sex, that separates actuality from desire, flowing from what is to what will be. History is not the past. 
History is a story we tell in the present, one that reaches back to conjoin what can be known of what has already transpired to our vision of whatever yet may come. History is not a fact, but a promise. It is the assurance that the future will be as different from the current moment as the current moment has become from all that has come before. History is a witness that bears testimony to the inescapability of difference and the inevitability of change. To write history can be more than stringing one brute fact after another and to fill up the emptiness of time. It can be more than constructing a monument to the violence of the great and powerful, more than the satisfaction of a craving among the people for the sweet comfort of nostalgia at the end of a bitter day. To write history, for those of us who need another world, is to catch sight elsewhere of a radical possibility made visible by the light of a current calamity. History transpires in the here and now. It is the story that makes real, pasts that are unremembered, and actions now unimagined, in anticipation of futures that must be summoned forth from a present that demands our daily effort to shatter and transform it. Something has already shifted, something tectonic, climatic. We see the evidence all around us as surely as the planet grindingly adjusts the placement of its continents, as surely as new patterns of earth, air, fire, and water arrange themselves across the warming surface of the globe. Gender, a vast impersonal social apparatus that, like some magical Hogwarts sorting hat, whispers the secret of our identity into our ears and places us with our kind. Gender itself has changed and is changing still. The novel configurations of personhood now bubbling to the top of the cultural stew, the new gender minorities now clamoring for social recognition, are the signs and symptoms of a deeper flux in the field of life. The novel configurations of personhood now bubbling to the top of the cultural stew, the new gender minorities now clamoring for social recognition are the signs and symptoms of a deeper flux in the field of life. The story of that Leviathan, gender, within and against whose shifting shape we all move in our own peculiar ways, is the story that now must be told anew. Those are the opening paragraphs of my work in progress, a nonfiction book aimed at a general audience called What Transpires Now, Transgender History and the Future We Need. The book originated in 2015 amidst the froth of publicity that attended Caitlyn Jenner's debut on the stage of public womanhood when the time felt ripe for a big book on transgender history, the go-to resource for all those people who were saying, in effect, what's up with this transgender thing? How come so much of it these days? Where did that come from? What does it all mean? Well, 2015 now seems like a long time ago. And the book that I envisioned then bears only a passing resemblance to the book that's now nearing completion. Back then, transgender people were experiencing heightened levels of visibility in media and acceptance in society, and seemed on the cusp of gaining unprecedented forms of legal recognition, civil rights protection, and healthcare access. The transgender actress Laverne Cox had recently graced the cover of Time Magazine for a story that asked, is America at a transgender tipping point? The Obama administration was boldly drafting new executive orders, offering new interpretations of existing anti-discrimination legislation, <clears throat> opening up the military to transgender service members, enforcing the provisions in the Affordable Care Act that required coverage for medical services related to gender transition, and suing recalcitrant state governments to better secure legal equality for trans people. A landmark case on behalf of Virginia high school student Gavin Grimm's right to use a public toilet that matched his gender identity and expression was on its way to the Supreme Court, which promised a definitive ruling on the constitutionally protected status of trans rights. It felt at the time that the biggest narrative challenge I faced in writing the book was cautioning my prospective readers against a premature celebration 
of transgender's arrival at the table of citizenship and social inclusion. Because the remarkable advances of the early 21st century were by no means evenly distributed. While it was increasingly possible for the most privileged trans people to count as normal in the eyes of the state, transness nevertheless still functioned as an intensifier of every form of structural injustice and levels of violence against trans people of color, particularly trans women of color, were actually on the rise. When I started writing in the summer of 2016, Hillary Clinton was seemingly poised for the presidency, with no indication that her administration would alter the course on transgender issues set by her predecessor in the White House. 2016, of course, turned out differently than almost everyone expected. <clears throat> The election of Donald Trump radically altered the life worlds of transgender people, along with the life worlds of many others, of course, <clears throat> transforming us in an instant <clears throat> from the latest poster children for neoliberal multicultural diversity into a frontline battlefield of the, of the culture wars. The election changed the story that most needed to be told. The words with which I begin the book, the words I first spoke earlier at this podium tonight, deliberately evoke and echo sentiments expressed by the philosophers Friedrich Nietzsche and Walter Benjamin and their writings on the uses and abuses of history for the present and on the perpetually available capacity nestled within each current moment for our deep narratives of change over time to become undone and rewoven. It is possible, Benjamin famously said, to take control of the memory as it flashes in a moment of danger. Writing in 1940, during the Nazi reign over Europe, his view of history resonates deeply today. The tradition of the oppressed teaches us that the emergency situation in which we now live is the rule. We must arrive at a concept of history which corresponds to this. Then it will become clear that the task before us is the introduction of a real state of emergency, and our position in the struggle against fascism will thereby improve. The recent rise to power of a virulent new form of reactionary politics in the United States, a fascism for our times, <coughs> is the clearest illustration imaginable that a present calamity can change the questions that transgender people and others who are oppressed need to ask of the past as we seek to use a critical historiography to begin imagining a future we want to live in and to forge a path towards it. I want to tell tonight in shortened form just one of the stories I tell in the book, that of Frances Thompson, who lived and died in Memphis in the middle of the 19th century. The rudiments of Thompson's story were first recovered for contemporary audiences by the historian Hannah Rosen in her 2009 book on post-Civil War black womanhood, Terror in the Heart of Freedom. This vignette supplements Rosen's earlier work with original research of my own and exemplifies the kinds of violence that can be perpetrated at the intersections of transness, disability, and race to sustain the binaries that enable social hierarchies. Three bloody days in Memphis, Tennessee, in early May, 1866, helped ensure that the Civil War wouldn't really end, but rather shift into a different phase of antagonism known by the euphemism Reconstruction. A decade later, as Reconstruction itself was coming to an end, the war continued yet again by other means, and Francis Thompson's body became one of its battlefields. On those May days in 1866, the white citizens of Memphis, resentful after several years of occupation by Union forces, including regiments of black soldiers, rioted against the city's black residents. At least 46 black people were murdered, 75 injured, and 100 robbed. More than 90 black homes, 12 black churches, and four black schools were burned to the ground. And five black women reported being gang raped. One of those women was Frances Thompson. Thompson was born into slavery around 1840, and the newspaper stories that provide most of the information about her life contradict themselves about whether she was originally from Virginia or Maryland or perhaps Mississippi, as well as how long she had lived in Memphis. Whatever the case may have been, by 1866, Thompson was living by her wits, 
near the bayou in the black district south of downtown in a bare little house on Gayoso Avenue. She was a familiar figure around town, nicknamed Aunt Crutchy, because of the prosthesis she used, she said, on account of the cancer that had disabled her legs. Thompson made a living as best she could. She took in washing and ironing, sewed clothing, and took on boarders for whom she cooked and cleaned. She told fortunes and peddled hoodoo bags to her African-American neighbors. According to later newspaper reports, as well as surviving arrest records, she, she served as a procuress who helped arrange sexual liaisons, some of which were inter interracial. Thompson, in other words, was one of innumerable former slaves now adrift in the world, surviving by any means they could. On May 14th, less than two weeks after what is known as the Memphis Massacre, Congressman Thaddeus Stevens, the ardent emancipationist leader of the radical Republican faction who wanted to punish the South for its insurrection, saw in the Memphis riots a chance to push his agenda, particularly the adoption of the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which ensured the equal citizenship of men regardless of previous condition of servitude. Stevens proposed convening a congressional select committee to investigate the rioting with the goal of using it as political propaganda. His proposal was adopted and on May 22nd, the committee led by Congressman Elihu B. Washburn of Illinois, principal political patron of future president Ulysses S. Grant and a future presidential contender himself, arrived in Memphis to investigate what had transpired a few short weeks before. On June 1, Francis Thompson hobbled into the meeting hall of the Gayoso Hotel to testify before Washburn's committee. She told how seven men, including two police officers, broke into her house soon after midnight in the early morning of May 2nd, demanding that she and a 16-year-old boarder, Lucy Smith, who was also disabled and known by the street nickname Stumpy, prepare a supper for them, which they did in a bid to avoid provoking the intruders. After the men had eaten, they said they wanted some women to sleep with, to which Thompson replied that she and Smith were not that sort of women and they must go. The men replied that it didn't make a damn bit of difference to them what kind of women the two considered themselves to be. They stayed for four hours, with all seven of them participating in the rape of one or both of the women. They ransacked Thompson's house, found and stole money that she had secreted away, looted the house of furnishings and food, and dumped what they could not carry away with them in the nearby bayou. The testimony offered by Thompson, along with the rape testimony of Lucy Smith, Rebecca Bloom, Harriet Armour, and Lucy Tibbs, was utterly unprecedented, not merely for its characterization of mass rape as a practice of systemic terror, Black women, who had so recently been slaves without rights, were still at that time not allowed to testify in municipal and state courts on account of their gender. And the congressional investigation offered them a novel opportunity to assert a newly claimed citizenship whose boundaries were still largely undefined for black and female subjects. It was the first time in the United States that black women had offered public testimony of any kind in a legal setting asserting not only their honor and worth and outrage, <clears throat> but their status as citizens entitled to stand before the bar of justice. All of the women told tales similar to Thompson's, of white men who approached them as if they were by definition available to them, who tried to insinuate that the women were prostitutes or that they had wanted the men and didn't resist the sexual advances, that there were political dimensions to the violence they suffered of men who asserted not only masculinist power over women, but white supremacy and black subordination, and a violent determination <clears throat> to restore all the pre-war social hierarchies. All of the women, Thompson included, publicly refuted the characterizations others tried to impose on them and publicly defined themselves on their own terms. Thompson was one of 164 witnesses who gave testimony that ran to 1,200 pages in the congressional record, 11,000 copies of which were printed and mailed at government expense throughout the United States. 
The report was widely excerpted in newspapers from coast to coast. Thompson's story, along with the stories offered by the four other raped women, was given special mention. The crowning acts of atrocity and diabolism committed during these terrible nights were the ravishing of five different colored women by these fiends in human shape, Washburn wrote in his prefatory comments to the published testimony. The accounts given by Thompson and Lucy Smith and the three other women became Exhibit A in the case for radical reconstruction, which soon became federal policy over President Andrew Johnson's opposition, in no small part because of publicity given to the Memphis massacre and to the testimony of those five women. A story published a decade later in the National Weekly Illustrated newspaper, The Day's Doings, noted that the committee's report startled the country and became a powerful campaign document used with great effect throughout the North and Northwest and among the Southern Negroes. Nothing in the report, the day's doings claimed, so horrified the country and intensified Northern prejudices against the South as the testimony of Francis Thompson. Thompson disappeared soon thereafter from the public record but her story was resurrected several years later with tragic consequences in the context of a heated presidential campaign. Election season in 1876 officially kicked off in Memphis on July 11th of that year. The front runners, apologies to the Canadian audience for so much US political history here, but the front runners were Samuel Tilden of New York from the pro-business wing of the Democratic Party who advocated ending radical reconstruction, and Rutherford B. Hayes of Ohio, a moderate Republican who channeled a growing disenchantment within the party over the corruption and ineffectiveness of the administration of Ulysses S. Grant. Most people considered the election that year to be a referendum on the future direction of the United States, whether the post-war period of reconstruction would finally be brought to a close. And on the morning of that very day, July 11th, as an opening salvo of the election season in Memphis, Tennessee, Francis Thompson was placed under arrest, <clears throat> subjected to a medical examination, charged and convicted of being a man impersonating a woman, fined $50, forced into men's attire, and sentenced to 100 days working on the chain gang of prisoners who maintained the city streets. This was a gendered form of punishment usually meted out to men, but not to women though sometimes used against women as it was used against Thompson as a way of stripping claims to womanhood from them. Appearing in public, quote, in a dress not belonging to his or her sex, as the anti-cross-dressing statute worded the offense, was first criminalized in Memphis in 1863 as part of a wave of similar legislation across the United States and the Confederacy during the war years. The spate of anti-cross-dressing ordinances might well have been related to efforts by men to evade the draft, or more likely, to efforts by women and transmasculine people to try to join the army. But it's also the case that the cities known to have passed anti-cross-dressing laws between the 1840s and 1860s were all experiencing a great influx of new people with scant ties or no ties at all to the places they now found themselves living. Mid-19th century anti-cross-dressing laws were passed in places like Toledo, Ohio, situated at the nexus of the railroad and canal networks that linked Chicago and the continental interior with New York and the transatlantic trade. Houston, Texas, a commercial and railroad hub for the export of southern cotton. And San Francisco, California, an instant city after the gold rush of 1849 which mushroomed from a sleepy Mexican village of 200 in 1846 to the largest city on the Pacific coast of the American continents by 1860 with more than 50,000 inhabitants. In Memphis, the new laws against cross-dressing coincided with a flood of black refugees from the Deep South who began arriving there in 1862 as the southernmost territory controlled by the Union. Because law has an imaginary dimension, attempting to secure the future against disruptions to social order that might be merely fantasized in the present, it may or may not have been the case 
that in rapidly urbanizing locales across the continent, there were actually large enough numbers of people publicly wearing clothing considered to belong to another sex for local authorities to notice and to legislate against the practice. It may have been simply that having a visible appearance at odds with the meaning of one's flesh was becoming increasingly perceived as a social threat. Whatever the case, the Memphis Ordinance Against Cross-Dressing was on hand and available for use against Frances Thompson when the moment arrived to take advantage of her anomalous status for an ulterior political end. Frances Thompson had had her run-ins with the law for many years previous to her arrest on the morning of July 11, 1876. According to one newspaper story, she had been, quote, arrested several times on suspicion of being a man and for notorious lewdness, but had always managed to avoid being charged with a crime. Perhaps, as Thompson said in a jailhouse interview, because she could, quote, disclose startling secrets which would bring disgrace upon and ruin many a white man in Memphis. Thompson also claimed to have told authorities numerous times that she was of double sex with physically ambiguous genitalia, but that she had been raised as a girl and always dressed in feminine fashion and considered herself to be a woman. In 1876, however, her gender anomalies, apparently long known, proved too useful not to exploit. In that first expose of Thompson's gender history, the Memphis Public Ledger made sure to remind its readers that, quote, it will be remembered that when the Congressional Committee investigated the Memphis riots, Frances Thompson swore that she had been outraged 13 times, and this was used by the Radical Party as part of the campaign thunder to excite the Negroes and keep them in the ranks of radicalism. That reminder was to be repeated incessantly in the months ahead, as Thompson's story was picked up in newspapers from Michigan to Louisiana to Washington, D.C., and profiled in the nationally circulated illustrated weekly, The Day's Doings. Quote, since the Rads made immense political capital out of Thompson on account of his adventures during the Memphis riots, the Memphis Daily Appeal satirically opined on July 13th, they should, as a matter of justice, change the name of their party to the Crutchy Club. The subtext of all such stories was that because Thompson had purportedly misrepresented her true sex, her testimony before Washburn's committee was therefore suspect, and that an important rationale in the argument for Reconstruction was thus based on a palpable falsehood. Most pointedly, the assertion that Thompson's genitalia were different from that of most other women was used to imply that she could not possibly have been raped. And the sad fact of the matter is that rape was legally defined as non-consensual vaginal penetration. Whatever outrage was perpetrated on the person of Frances Thompson, if she did not in fact have a penetrable vagina, in the eyes of the law she could not have been raped. And she was made to suffer a form of violence in addition to those already directed at her due to her blackness and femininity that remains utterly without a name. Nearly 50 newspaper articles were published about Thompson during the presidential election cycle of 1876, many of them by Democratic-leaning presses that mocked the Republicans for having been hoodwinked by a gender charlatan. And these stories used the stigma associated with blackness, transness, sex work, and disability to pillory their political opponents. They labeled Thompson an infamous his, her, and punned on race and gender by accusing her of being under false colors as a man who has successfully passed as a woman. In imagining how, quote, the dusky Thompson's lower limbs were as crooked as a young dogwood tree or a ram's horn, they associated her differences from gender norms with the status of being non-human. The press further assassinated Thompson's public persona by questioning whether she was actually disabled. His lameness does not amount to much, the day's doings noted, claiming that, quote, the use of crutches was but an affectation to facilitate his infamous calling and was, in fact, a longstanding ruse dating to pre-war days to appear so lame and crippled, quote, that as a slave she would have been of little value. 
public attention to disability was on the rise in the middle decades of the 19th century, due in part to the increased prevalence of on-the-job accidents in newly mechanized industrial workplaces as well as to the horrific increase in battlefield maiming during the first modern industrialized war. Disability and transness have much in common in that both statuses are acquirable, move bodies down the hierarchies of life, and stage social anxieties about bodily transformations that compel a person previously considered normal to become socially abject. They offer evidence that bodies are alterable in ways that belie the fantasy manifested in racial beliefs that expresses the unconscious desire for embodiment to be unchangeable and therefore a suitable means for permanently fixing people into ranked social categories. Francis Thompson's precarious life offered an easy target for taking aim at all such fears. It's no longer possible to determine whether Thompson was disabled or not, or which reporter was lying, the one who said her legs were as curved as the horns of a ram, or the one who said that her impairment was a pretense. Like asserting a trans identity or making a claim of rape, the reality of being disabled is routinely challenged. Like disabled people, transgender people are often suspected of being fakes, malingerers, con artists, and criminals who are simply trying to perpetrate a fraud. What matters more than the impossible task of adjudicating the truth of Thompson's claims is acknowledging how often she had to assert herself against multiple accusations of self-misrepresentation, how frequently she was forced to sustain herself in the face of persistent acts of erasure, how vulnerable she was to the undermining of her reality. When the existence of one transgender person is turned into a public spectacle, it rarely fail, fails to draw attention to others. This was certainly the case in Frances Thompson's affair. The Daily Appeal reported in August on what it called a Thompson epidemic among the Negroes and described two additional cases that had been reported in the press. One involved Ann Casey, who had been arrested for vagrancy and while incarcerated was discovered to have male anatomy. Casey told reporters that because of her delicate build, the other slaves in the household in which she had been raised had dressed her in feminine attire since early childhood, and she had simply grown accustomed to presenting herself as a woman. She had taken to wandering since her emancipation and would flee from town to town whenever she was suspected of being male. The other, far more extensive case of crutchyism came to light in New Orleans, where it was reported that, quote, a gang of men in feminine appearance who in long clothes impersonate women and as such secure employment as domestics, preferring to be thus rather than as nature destined them. Being at the eye of a national storm in a contentious political climate had devastating consequences for what little was left of Frances Thompson's life. The crowds that came to taunt her while working on the chain gang were so large that they blocked the sidewalks. And after picking up a paving stone to hurl at the head of one of her tormentors, Thompson was confined to the jailhouse where she was put in charge of the laundry. In a jailhouse interview with the Daily Appeal, she railed in that newspaper's words against the white persons who brought him to this country and said it was they who had knowingly allowed her to dress as she did her entire life who should be punished. And if anyone is to suffer for his wearing of women's attire, it is them. She described her confinement as persecution and complained that the police treated her very grossly whenever the opportunity presented, exhibiting her with evident delight to the curious eye of the public. When she announced that she planned to leave the region as soon as she was released, the police responded by photographing Thompson in both men's and women's attire so that the images could be sent to other cities quote, to prevent this hideous criminal from playing the same role again. <clears throat> the images, a collision and collusion of the forensic with the spectacular, were reproduced as woodcut illustrations and circulated nationally in the day's doings. Social appearance <clears throat> is the effect of a coordinated assemblage of looks, styles, acts, and movements, locations, and relations with others. 
that the technologies of image capture disarticulate, <clears throat> select from, stage, and recontextualize in the act of producing something that passes for verisimilitude. The images published in the day's doings did not document Thompson's social appearance. <coughs> they demolished it. <coughs> Represented in menswear, Thompson is made to appear in a manner that successfully cites the visual codes that reproduce cultural beliefs about what constitutes the reality of gender. She looks like a man. For the photo of her in feminine attire, her usual clothing having been confiscated, Thompson's female rigging had to be improvised, as the newspaper phrased it, and was not put on so daintily by Mr. Thompson as Mrs. Thompson would have done it in her day. Rather than showing how Thompson appeared in daily life, the image functioned primarily to humiliate her by staging her incompetence and looking like a woman. She looks like a man in a dress. She looks broken. You can see it in her eyes. Karl Marx famously wrote that men make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances already existing, given and transmitted from the past. The same could be said of how trans people are able to appear at any given historical moment. Thompson certainly did not appear as she pleased. And the circumstances under which she was compelled to appear link these only known images of her to legacies of objectification that stretch back to the earliest histories of the photographic medium. There is nothing new in pointing out that the camera can be a tool for domination, a machine for mechanically manifesting a gaze that subjugates and represents what it frames, thereby rendering the objectified body into a visual resource for the reproduction of dominant relations of power. The camera records what the abstract machine of the social surveillance apparatus seeks to see as the individual bodies that compose the collective body politic are perpetually observed, their particularities measured against a grid of norms and ideals, their differences targeted for correction or cultivation. The ethnographic illustration, the medical case study, the criminal mugshot are kin who haunt the background of even the most self-actualizing of photographic portraits. They provide the context transmitted from the past yet still operating in the present within which the non-normatively sexed and gendered are compelled to appear and within which we struggle still to appear as we desire to be seen. After serving her sentence, Frances Thompson left police custody destitute and in dire health. She took shelter in a ramshackle shack at the edge of the bayou, where she was discovered days later, suffering from severe dysentery, which she had acquired in jail. Members of the black community took her to the city hospital, where she died the following day, Friday, November 3rd, just in time to make headlines once again before the presidential election was held the following Tuesday. Of the dead say nothing but what is good, is an old Latin proverb, the public ledger editorialized after printing Thompson's death notice. But truth compels us to state that but few, but <clears throat> to <clears throat> compels us to state that but few more notorious villains ever cursed the earth than was Francis Thompson in life. After a long life of infamous lewdness and wickedness, he sleeps well. The election of 1876 turned out to be the most closely contested in U.S. history. It still holds the record for highest turnout of eligible voters at nearly 82 percent, a testament to how momentous the outcome seemed for the future direction of the country. Tilden, the Democrat, handily won the popular vote and captured 184 electoral college votes to, Hayden's, uh, to Hayes' 165. But 20 electoral votes, all but one from the Deep South, were disputed by Republicans who charged the Democrats with suppressing the black vote through outright terror and intimidation. After months of political gridlock, the national political leaders struck a dubious deal. The so-called Compromise of 1877 awarded all of the contested electoral votes to Hayes, thereby giving him a one-vote margin of victory over Tilden, 185 to 184, and allowing the Republicans to remain in the White House. 
In exchange, the Republicans agreed to abandon Reconstruction. This in turn allowed the Democrats to gain control of all the southern state houses, dismantle the political gains blacks had made over the previous decade, and institute the apartheid regime known as Jim Crow. Although Francis Thompson's sad story played only a small role in this momentous struggle, <coughs> her death and difficult life offer an eerie premonition of racial and transgender issues that continue to haunt the political imagination of the US polity a century and a half later, at another historic moment in which minority rights are beginning to be rolled back in the aftermath of another contentious and contested election. Transgender issues played an, outside rhetor an outsized rhetorical role during the 2016 Republican presidential primaries in ways that suggest a persistence to the problematics of governance that Thompson was burdened with exemplifying. Campaigning that summer in Indiana alongside former Indiana governor and future vice president Mike Pence, presidential hopeful Ted Cruz pinned his last hope for halting Trump's momentum on waving the bloody shirt of transgender rights in town after town to rile up his supporters. <clears throat> Appearing before a large crowd in Knightstown, Indiana with his two daughters aged seven and five, standing by his side in matching pink dresses, Cruz drew supportive boos and hisses when he told the crowd that Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton both agree that grown men should be allowed to use the little girl's restroom. Failed candidate Mike Huckabee had gotten the ball rolling more than a year earlier when he shared a prurient fantasy with attendees at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention in Nashville, Tennessee in February 2015. Huckabee imagined what could happen if transgender people were allowed to share space with non-transgender people in toilets and locker rooms based on how he imagined he himself would act. Now, I wish that someone had told me when I was in high school that I could have felt like a woman when it came time to take showers in PE, Huckabee said, to much laughter. I'm pretty sure that I would have found my feminine side and said, coach, I think I'd rather shower with the girls today. In November of that year, in a foreshadowing of North Carolina's notorious bathroom bill, HB2, <clears throat> the following February, Transgender issues would be used to overturn HERO, the Houston Equal Rights Ordinance, a sweeping piece of anti-discrimination legislation by reductively characterizing it as a bathroom bill. Its opponents focused with laser-like precision on the supposed danger of transgender women using the ladies' room. Houston's airwaves were inundated with television ads that showed a predatory white man entering a woman's public toilet, hiding in a stall, and emerging to corner an unsuspecting little white girl while a somber voice narration warned that if hero were not repealed, any man at any time could enter a woman's restroom simply by claiming to be a woman that day, even registered sex offenders. While Frances Thompson's tragically foreshortened life staged the intersections of transness, blackness, and disability, the campaign to overturn hero imagined their interchangeability. The campaign's television ad literally substitutes the figure of a white trans woman represented as a deranged male sex predator in girl drag for the more familiar fantasy threat of the black rapist as the most salient danger for white womanhood and the birth of the white nation. On display here is the fear that bodies can slip their chains <clears throat> and lose their imagined ability to anchor persons in a social hierarchy. It is the fear materially embodied by the body that has become transformed through disablement, a fear figured by the transgender body that is made to represent a false claim to transformation, a fear that grows from the long history of race and is rooted in the desire for social hierarchy to be grounded in differences of the flesh. The political stakes over contemporary controversies about transgender toilets are thus not dissimilar to those that animated post-Civil War debates about Reconstruction. As preposterous as the hullabaloo over where transgender people should be allowed to relieve themselves seems at a certain level, at another level it touches questions of governance and public policy that are perhaps <laughs> rationally irresolvable. Whose body is recognized as legitimately belonging to the collective body politic rather than being a resource to be exploited for the benefit of others or to be eliminated. Which bodies shall be fully accommodated in public space? 
How does the public sphere afford or deny access to various classes of people? And who gets to decide? Within a federation that divides governmental powers between local, state, and national levels, how are disputes over who counts as a citizen entitled to equal protection under the law to be resolved between culturally different geographical regions of a sprawling nation other than by force? The answer to these questions, to these very questions, are precisely what is at stake, what was at stake in Reconstruction and they raise the unsettling question of whether our current difficulties are just another battle in an ongoing and still unresolved civil war. Is this what transpires now? Mm -hmm.